The word epiphany literally means to shine upon, to reveal. So when someone says, I had an epiphany, that means I've had a revelation. Like for example, recently I had a revelation, an epiphany, that Father Miguel was a normal person. I just, I just realized it all of a sudden. Today we celebrate the Feast of the Epiphany in which, which we here as Christians, we declare that Jesus is the epiphany of God. He's the full revelation of God and today he's revealed to the nations. It's interesting to see the kind of response that people have to this revelation, right? Because the response to the revelation of God matters. On the one hand, you have Herod's response. Right, Herod is, 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 is the kind of like a puppet king that the Romans put over the, to rule over the Jews, right? Notice what kind of response he has. He's threatened, if you may, by Jesus. This is what it says. It says, he was greatly troubled at the announcement of, the, of this newborn king of the Jews when the Magi come to him. Why? Right? Because he and his kingdom might be threatened by the coming of another king. Listen to what he says to the, to the Magi. He says, go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word that I too may go and do him homage. Herod has no intention of worshiping Jesus, no intention of giving him homage. He has no interest in bowing before another king. So he gives lip service to the Magi, pretending to be one way, but inside being filled with fear and insecurity. So as a result, what does he try to do? He tries to kill the child. And this is where we get the feast of the holy innocents. He kills all the children under two years old around the vicinity of Jerusalem, I'm sorry, of Bethlehem, because he's insecure. He tries to snuff out the light of the world because darkness has overcome his heart. So that's one response to the newborn king, the epiphany of God. The other response is from the Magi. Now, the Magi were from, like, they were from the East, most likely from Persia. They were kind of the academics or the scientists of the day. They were involved in astrology and astronomy. They were constantly seeking wisdom. And God meets them where they're at and gives them a sign in the heavens, which is a star, that a newborn king or that a king has been born. So as a result of them seeking wisdom, they're willing to make great sacrifices and travel hundreds of miles to come to do homage to this newborn king. And when they meet him, they surrender everything to him. They open the treasures that they brought and submit it to him. And they give him homage, which is a sign of Christian worship. That's the kind of response that I believe God is inviting the whole world to. So how we respond to the revelation or the epiphany of God matters. If you've seen the bulletin, you know that this weekend we're unveiling our discipleship pathway to the parish. It's something that we talked about with our leaders on August 2nd, and it's something we're releasing to the parish. And so this is essentially a strategic framework or a strategy for, by which we can make disciples of Jesus. That we can help people respond kind of like the Magi to open our hearts and to worship God as he reveals himself to us. One of the things that we, I think, all know is that we live in a very different culture than we did 50, 60 years ago. Perhaps 60 years ago, if you were not a really an active, intentional Catholic, you could actually become a decent person by following the rest of culture. Because we held up virtue. We held up a certain understanding of reality in such a way that we could perhaps follow God and not have to be as, as, as kind of intentionally going against everybody else. But as we begin to see, as our culture rejects God, it rejects Jesus, it's rejecting the foundation of Western civilization, it's becoming increasingly difficult for us to follow him. And therefore, we need to actually be choosing and to be more intentional in following Jesus. And so as a result, the church has rediscovered uh, her missionary identity. The church has always understood herself as being missionary by nature. After all, Jesus says to the disciples before he ascends, go and make disciples of all nations. Right? So the church is missionary by her nature, but th as a response to the Holy Spirit reminding us, that we exist to evangelize. The church exists to evangelize. And so at St. Pat's here, one of the things you probably heard me preach about the last few years is that our purpose is to make spirit-filled missionary disciples of Jesus Christ for the glory of God the Father. 
To be honest, the entire mission of the church is to make disciples. Every single parish has the goal of making disciples of Jesus. That's the mission of the church. So when we talk about evangelization, that just simply means making disciples. So I want to break this down a little bit before I talk about really a strategy of how we're going to do that. So the first is, what is a disciple? A disciple is someone who chooses to surrender one's entire life to Jesus in faith and chooses to follow him, to learn from him, so that we can actually follow him through death to the resurrection. Is someone who chooses to surrender one's entire life to Jesus in faith so that we can learn from him, we can be his student, and we can follow him through death to the resurrection. That's not something we can do unless we know who he is. That's why part of um, being a disciple is actually proclaiming the good news of the gospel. We tell people about what, who Jesus is, what he's done for us, and what he's asking of us. And so that's what it means to be a disciple. And I don't know anyone who can accidentally surrender their lives to a person. And so it requires a certain intentionality. But at St. Pat's here, what we're emphasizing is that we want to make not just disciples, we want to make spirit-filled disciples. And the reality is we're emphasizing spirit-filled because we know what happens when the Holy Spirit comes alive in someone's life. When the Holy Spirit is released in someone's life, they come to know that they know that, the, that God is their loving Father. They become convinced that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the universe. He's our King, and they're able to submit their lives to Him. When the Holy Spirit is released, there's a certain amount of conviction and desire to follow Jesus and the capacity to follow Him. There are a lot of people who claim to be disciples who aren't really convinced that God loves them. They're not convinced that in Jesus they have the forgiveness of sins, and they certainly have a hard time living in hope of the resurrection. And so we want disciples to be filled with the Holy Spirit so we can live in hope that no matter what's going on in our life, God has a plan for us and he loves us and his love is stronger than death. Because that's what we mean by a spirit-filled disciple. The second thing we want to emphasize here at St. Pat's, and we've said this before, is that disciples are missionary. And we're using the word missionary not just because the Holy Father is using it and not just because Pope, um, sorry, um, Bishop Boyer has used it, it's not just because it, it makes a lot of sense for us to say this, but we want to emphasize that disciples by nature are those who make other disciples. That we live our lives in such a way that we're attractive witnesses to what God is capable of doing in the, in the, in the world. And that we're partners in his mission. That means to be a missionary disciple means to desire to bring other people to God and bring, other, and bring God to other people. One sign that you can maybe see in your own life that you're a missionary disciple is that you desire other people to know Jesus. And you're seeking, according to your gifts and your state of life, to do what you can to bring other people to know him. That's the kind of disciple that God is desiring. That's the kind of disciple that we see in the New Testament. And that's why we emphasize missionary. So what does success look like? One of the things that's important for us to think about is what would happen if our parish was filled with spirit-filled missionary disciples. Let me, let me ask you this, or not, let, me, let me propose this to you. Imagine if we had a parish in which everyone has come alive in God, in which everyone was deeply convinced that we have been made beloved children of the Father, that in Jesus we have the full forgiveness of sins, that in Him we have the hope of eternal life. Imagine if we were so, we've experienced God's love so much that we've been experiencing healing from our own wounds, that we have the, the, the desire and the capacity to resist the lies of the culture so that we can be good husbands, good wives, loving fathers and mothers, that we can actually bring about renewal in our, sp our spheres of influences. We can bring his love and truth to people around us. Imagine if we had a parish that every single parishioner knew that he or she was loved was known, and that every parishioner knew that they actually were supported by others in their path to growing in maturity in the Christian life. Imagine if every parishioner exuded the peace, the joy, and the love of God, which are signs of God's presence in the Christian life. Imagine if every, every community member of our parish or every member of the parish knew their gifts, and they, they had this confidence of actually living out and bringing God's love to people around them. 
What kind of parish do you think we would have? In fact, what kind of, of parish do you think or what kind of impact would we have in our surrounding area? This is just a glimpse of where we're going. The pathway that we're releasing this weekend is how we're going to get there. So I want to encourage you, I'm not going to go over the whole pathway here, um, but I want to encourage you to pick up a bulletin this weekend and read through it. It's kind of, we took a while to actually spell out the pathway in the bulletin, and it kind of goes, it's a kind of a strategic thing, goes from one place to another. But one of the things about this is that I, I want to encourage us is that this pathway actually helps us be successful in our mission. And I firmly believe in that. So I want to just offer a few things that are actually about the pathway that, that are really important for us to remember. Number one, this is not just another new thing in evangelization. It's not a new fad. It's not something that's going to pass. It's, it's really a strategic framework that helps us to focus on what's going to move the needle of our parish being successful in bringing those who don't believe in God, who don't believe in Jesus, to a transforming experience of God's love to become mature disciples. So it's not just for us. It's for those who are, who are not even believing in God. And this pathway, I believe, actually helps us do that. A common mistake in many parishes is to try to do everything or to try to do nothing. So just kind of keep doing things, just being busy and just throwing everything against the wall and see what, see what works. But the most effective parishes in the country and even in the world are intentional at where they're leading people. They're intentional at what they're doing to bring people to the next level of maturity. That's what this pathway represents. And the good news is, is that we're already doing many of the things in the pathway here. We're already, we've already been doing these things, and now we're just going to be a little bit more explicit about why we've been doing the things that we've been doing. Number two, the pathway that we've developed is actually going to fulfill the vision that Bishop Boyer has for all the parishes in the diocese. As you know, I was a part of the RRM committee, and we developed with the bishop this vision for all the healthy par for all parishes in the diocese. And this vision here at St. Pat's is going to help us fulfill that. So, in other words, this isn't this isn't just like St. Pat's doing its own thing. If you haven't heard of other parishes having a strategy, it's likely because we're ahead of the game, and other parishes will be developing that strategy in the future. So, this is ultimately something that everyone is going to be doing. Number three. Our pathway is dynamic. That means, it, we're not, it, it means we can change it or adapt it if the circumstances change or the Holy Spirit asks us to do something else. We're not sticking ourselves in a particular mode and staying like that if we, don't, if we have to change. Like any strategy, it can adapt. And so this is one of the things that we, we really love about this. We've already adjusted it, adapted it since we've released it uh, to the leaders of the parish on August 2nd. But this is something that we can adjust if we need to. And finally, I just really want to encourage you with this. I believe in people. I believe in you. I believe that you can respond to the call of the Christian life in its fullness. One of the temptations that perennially, perennially attacks the church is compromise. That we offer less than what Jesus is offering and we expect of people less than what he is expecting. And as a result, churches die. People aren't alive in their faith. And this is one of the great temptations what we see in dying churches. But I believe that you're capable of responding to the gospel because I believe in the power of the gospel. I believe that God does not call us to something without giving us the grace to do it. And therefore, as I see what is possible in the Christian life, I know that you can be called higher and that you can actually reach that, that, that limit, that you can actually become who God calls you to be by baptism. So as your pastor, I refuse to allow our families to be destroyed by unbelief. I refuse to allow us to kind of just give in to a culture that does not know God. And, and so as a result, we're choosing to move forward, seeking to say yes to everything that God asks us to do, to become mature Christians who are capable of being a vibrant parish, but are capable of being compelling witnesses of the gospel. It's very possible that people can respond to the epiphany of Jesus by just simply giving him lip service, by simply becoming like Herod, pretending to worship, but having no intention of submitting our lives to him. My prayer is that as we come forward to receive Holy Communion, that we might act more like the Magi, 
submitting ourselves to Jesus, the epiphany of God, opening up the treasures of our hearts and our lives, offering to God pure and holy worship. Because after all, that is the only sensible response to the full revelation of God. And it's the only hope that we have of being with him forever.